Ever since two Chechen brothers were implicated in the Boston bombings, people have been going through history books to see what is distinctive about Islam in the Caucasus. Even though this has little to do with the murky background of the Boston bombings, it will help us understand part of the context. Because fundamental Islamism and Chechen nationalism is no longer just Russian politics, but now also part of American politics. This is a Kaspi report by Mishir Wang, doing a report for storm clouds gathering. In the same way that the Atlantic Ocean influenced the British and the frontier formed the Americans, the Caucasus mountains developed the Caucasian peoples. The Caucasus is a melting pot of cultures. There are three distinct language families in the region and every one of those language families has its own set of subgroups like Chechen, Georgian, Azeri, etc. Now mountainous places tend to have more ethnic groups and the Caucasus is home to some 50 ethnic groups. From a religious perspective it is equally diverse. There are Orthodox Christians, Oriental Christians, Sunni and Shia Muslims and even Salafis or Wahhabis. Now despite all their internal differences, the Caucasians are actually more alike than apart. They have similar traditions, similar moral values, similar sports, they have the same cuisine and music and in fact in some of their songs the lyrics are even the same. But their histories are different and the Caucasus can be divided in two parts. In the south you have the centralized independent countries which are stable and to the north you have the decentralized small autonomous states of the Russian Federation which are known for their high instability. Unlike the south the North Caucasus was for a millennia long impassable. This was after all the highest range in Europe and it could only be crossed on foot and even then only in the summer. Throughout history the south was conquered by many empires. Among them were the Greeks, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Romans, the Arabs, the Seljuks, etc. But the North Caucasus remained largely untouched and so there was no need for any kind of unity or centralization. Chechens, Avars, Lesgis, Nogai, Balkar, these people had no overlords, no kings, no rulers. The only times they united was to resist a common enemy, like the Mongol invasions. No outside force was really able to conquer the North Caucasus, that is until the Russians arrived in force during the rule of Catherine the Great. But even the centralized Russian state with all its superior weaponry and disciplined army had a hard time fighting against the disorganized North Caucasians. The Russian conquest of the Caucasus was one of the longest and bloodiest military confrontations in Russian history. The North Caucasians formed a government of their own called the Caucasian Imamat. Chechens and Kirkassians formed the backbone of the Caucasian army. And this newly founded state reached its peak during the rule of Imam Shamil. But the country was only united in their fight against the Russian Empire. Other than that, Chechens, Avars, Balkans did not get along. In fact, the leader of the country, Imam Shamil, argued that the Chechens should be wiped out because he found them to be too stubborn. Eventually, the Russian Empire won. But maintaining control over the Caucasus turned out to be a different story. Despite the surrender of Imam Shamil, the Chechens and Kirkassians continued resisting the Russian state and therefore Russia's position was not secure. So the Russian Empire decided to ethnically cleanse the region. About 400,000 Kirkassians were killed and the remaining 500,000 were deported to the Ottoman Empire. Only 80,000 Kirkassians were left alive in their homelands. The empty lands of western North Caucasus were then slowly settled by ethnic Russians. This experience left a deep mark in the Caucasian history and it's the reason why Caucasians generally dislike Russia. But even after the ethnic cleansings of their neighbors, the Chechens continued to resist well into the 20th century. For example, in 1931, about 35,000 Chechens were purged and another 14,000 were killed in 1937. But even after centuries of persecution and oppression, the Chechens did not submit to the Russian rule. There is a saying in the Caucasus that it takes a Caucasian to defeat a Caucasian. And that particular Caucasian was Joseph Jugashvili, also known as Stalin. 
the Georgian-born Stalin came to the same conclusion as Imam Shamil. Chechens should be wiped out. In 1944, the Red Army rounded up the entire Chechen and Ingush nations and tens of thousands of people from other ethnic groups, they were all packed onto trains and shipped to Central Asia. Some 40 to 50 percent of the deportees were children, and 35 percent of the deportees died in the first month. The Chechens were resettled in the cold steppes of Kazakhstan. The only thing keeping them together was their faith, Sufi Islam. Out of desperation, the generation of Chechens that grew up in Kazakhstan became more and more fundamental in their religion. Meanwhile, back in the Caucasus, the Chechen and Ingush names were completely erased from all the Soviet books and documents. Cities were being renamed, mosques and graveyards were destroyed. Basically, the Chechen and Ingush histories were being rewritten from scratch. For a nation with such pride and loyalty to their homelands, this was a deep scar and an utter defeat from which they never recovered. It wasn't until 1959 that the Chechens were allowed to return to their homelands. And even then, the resettlement process was slow, because their homes were now settled by other ethnic groups. Only in 1985, the Chechens became a majority again in their homelands. A few years later, the Soviet Union collapsed and the Chechens declared themselves an independent state. The Chechen army quickly took control over their capital Grozny, but in 1994, the new Russian president Boris Yeltsin realized the strategic importance of the North Caucasus and he sent in the Russian army to deal with the Chechen uprising. Two years later, the Russian army was defeated and in 1997, Russia and Chechnya signed the peace treaty and the latter was on its way to become fully independent. But after their victory, the Chechens started to fight each other. Even Aslan Mashkadov, the core general of the Chechen army and now president of the Chechen government, could not control the fragmentation of Chechnya. The country was in complete anarchy and its economy had just collapsed. Organized crime was surging. Islamist warlords were taking control over parts of the country. It was complete chaos. Despite Mashkadov's objections, Wahhabi Islamist warlords such as Shamil Bashayev and Ibn al-Khattab launched the invasion of neighboring Dagestan in 1999. This was in breach of the peace treaty they had agreed earlier with the Russians, and so the new president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, nullified the treaty and responded with force. Despite the danger to civilians, Putin ordered the complete bombardment of the Chechen capital Grozny. The Russian military used every capability they had. Scud missiles, artillery, airstrikes. They pretty much flattened the entire city, block by block. And obviously, the number of civilian casualties was extremely high. Putin's move further radicalized the remaining Chechen rebels, and Wahhabism was surging. Up until then, Chechens were mostly Sufi Muslims. When they lost the Second Chechen War in 1999, Many Chechens, out of desperation, joined the Wahhabi cause. Equally important, it is in the Second War that many Chechen warlords switched their allegiance to Russia and from this point on, Chechens would be fighting Chechens. In the meantime, Mashkadov had lost his government and went into the resistance. And, despite his objections, the Wahhabi Chechens resorted to terrorist tactics. And this is when international sympathy towards Chechens drained away. The Moscow theater hostage crisis, the school hostage crisis in Beslan, the metro and train bombings, the airport bombings, etc. Thousands of civilians were killed, and none of these terrorist tactics worked. And by the time Mashkadov died, Wahhabism pretty much became the Chechen insurgency. And under the leadership of Doku Umarov, the Caucasus Emirate was declared. So the conflict in the North Caucasus is no longer limited to Chechnya. It involves the entire region. Wahhabism spread to neighboring republics. And today, many of their fighters are recruited from outside of Chechnya. The Russian side tightened its grip and the ordinary Chechens were caught in the middle. In the end, thousands of Chechens fled their homeland and formed diasporas in Western Europe and the Middle East. This was a Kasmi report by Mishirvan. Thank you for watching and Saul.